Hello. I'm fortunate enough to be Skyping this afternoon with Mason Bates, award-winning DJ and composer. Um, how are you doing this afternoon? Good. Great. Great. It's good to talk to you. Thanks. You too. So you've really created a unique place for yourself in the musical world by combining the orchestral music with electronic music and you perform with them and you DJ. How did you get started in each of these worlds and how did they end up intertwining? Well, I'm, I do have a variety of pots on the stove, but I, I got to say that the, the big thing for me is composing. You know, I'm, I'm really a composer for the concert space and everything really kind of works through that sensibility. I started DJing when I was in New York at Juilliard and then when I went out to San Francisco, I got much more involved with it, started DJing on my own and um, for many years was basically pursuing, you know, concert music for orchestra and chamber music uh, with one part of my brain and, and, and DJing with another. Those two things kind of came together um, about 10 years ago when I started to feel that there was just some real possibility musically between those two worlds. But I mean, as it is, I, you know, I don't always include electronics in every piece. And I, I, I feel like even when electronic component is part of a piece, it's important for me to make sure that it, it works kind of like as a new section or a new instrument, but um, it works within the totality of, of the composition. Right. Right. Well, great. And um, you're about to come to Ann Arbor to perform one of these pieces you've written with San Francisco Symphony. So I um, was wondering if you could tell us about what we should expect, what that'll be like, and what it's been like to work with them. Well, this is a piece called Mass Transmission for Chorus organ and electronics. There's actually no orchestra in this piece. And it's a setting of this um, rather obscure text about early 19, like it was like 1920 something, early radio communications between Holland and Java. It's a fascinating little piece of early radio history, almost like a kind of 1920s Skype. You, you've got on one end of the line, you've got this mother who is in Holland. And on the other end of the line, you've got her daughter who's been sent to work in the colonial Dutch government of the East Indies, which we now know as Java. And they're communicating over this, you know, vast distance that something nobody had ever really done. And it's just incredibly heartfelt what they're saying and the recollections about this experience that, that were compiled in this kind of obscure text. And um, it's, it was interesting to me as a piece that have, has these human emotions on such a basic level, but they're kind of pulsing through this medium of, of you know, technology, of, of, you know, radio waves. So it's a setting of this story and, um, it is a thrill to work with the symphony. Michael Dustin Thomas has commissioned, uh, this is the third piece from me, and I love working with him and uh, to work with the San Francisco Symphony Chorus, and um, its counterpart in Ann Arbor is thrilling. Great. And so you've, you've worked with some great symphonies, some great orchestras in the past, and um, you've also worked with YouTube Symphony. To, how did that compare... To working with a regular professional orchestra. Well, it was it was really mind blowing. On the one hand, you know, obviously the YouTube Symphony being a an orchestra that's kind of thrown together for a week of concerts is not going to be on the same level as say you know the Chicago Symphony or the New York Philharmonic or whatever. Um, but because it was thrown together in a week. Um, there was this incredible energy there and they were also much more willing to experiment and um, kind of put up with certain things that people generally in the highly regulated world of orchestras do not put up with. So having, um, you know, 
video running during pieces, having lots of, of lighting and stagecraft. Um, this was something, these were things that made the concert thrilling. And uh, I, I loved doing that. Great. Um, so I was fortunate enough to get to play the electronica part for uh, Rusty Air in Carolina with the oh, University wow. of Michigan Symphony Band a couple years ago. And I was corresponding with you about that, I remember. But um, some of the different sounds that you use range from acoustic drum sounds to electronic sounds and bleeps and blips and then also animals. There were all the cricket sounds and I feel like the, the possibilities are just so endless when you're adding these sounds that aren't traditional to the orchestra. How, how do you decide on what sounds to use when there are just so many? I think that's a great question. You, you know, any artists from musicians, composers to visual artists, painters, it, it, it is going to have to limit the palette in some way. And when you have electronic sounds, you literally have an infinite palette. I mean, because you can have any sound. Let's take that piece, um, Rusty Air in Carolina. You know, it was about the, the sound of the deep south in the summertime, all those buzzing insects. And so right there, I knew that at least some of the beats um, that would figure in, into the more rhythmic part of the piece would would be derived from like these insect noises. So, you know, on a very basic level, um, that content kind of drove some of that, those decisions. But I mean, also I, I knew that I wanted to have kind of like a insectoid, uh, techno bluesy thing in the middle of the piece. And I needed to find the right kinds of, you know, kind of, electronic kick drums and things that would be appropriate for that and that would um, be fresh when you heard them but have an inevitability to them. And that that also happens in, in mass transmission. You know, clearly the topic of it is, is radio. And so um, a great deal of the sounds that you hear come from these like shortwave radio recordings and you know little static bursts and things so i guess in a i try to i try to make the the sounds come organically out of, of the material of the piece but just like with within a standard orchestra when you when you start orchestrating and you decide that you need um actually you know you just need a tuba there sometimes when you have an electronic track you just realize you know, what we really need there is a really high-frequency ping. And it, I think the challenge is, is making all these sounds your own. You know, you have to, you know, I don't create my own oboe every time I have a performance, but I synthesize these different orchestral sounds to, to make a sound world. And that's kind of what you do electronically when you're writing. Right. Great. And um, so now on the other spectrum of things, do you ever take, lessons or things that you've learned in the orchestral world from composition lessons or writing for orchestra and then apply them to DJ? Well, absolutely. It's been a pretty fluid learning experience um, on both fronts. And I, I'd say that, you know, the thing that I take to, to DJing is, is mainly that you can have live musicians in that world and they can offer a ton. Um, and the challenge, of course, is trying to integrate live musicians into a setup that is not very flexible. I mean, when you're DJing, on the one hand, you do have pitch control, you have tempo control, you have your whole mixer in front of you. But, you know, you're dealing with um, records. You know, I mean, you're going from one record to the next, and it's not like you're playing jazz together and you know you can react instantaneously to what somebody is is doing if they're playing. So getting figuring out how to um, talk to the the live musicians, the improvisers who play with me when I when I DJ is is something that has has been highly informed by working with orchestras. Great. And um, you recently performed a piece with Detroit Symphony, and you described going to Detroit is sort of a homecoming because the, uh, the techno music and uh, all the roots that it's had there. Have you ever been to any other kind of electronic music meccas or places that have really influenced you uh, with different genres where you've had 
a similar feeling? Well, absolutely. I mean, Chicago, um, you know, if, if Detroit is the capital of techno, I mean, Chicago is the capital of house music. Yeah. Berlin, I lived in Berlin for about half of half a year in 2005. And um, so many great things happening there with spaces and how people use these spaces for in, in creative ways for events and, and different kinds of parties. You know, San Francisco has its own um, special kind of electronic scene. But just beyond electronic music, I mean, uh, you know, there's cities like Seattle that – you know, our real meccas for, you know, in that case, indie rock. And, and what, what to me is always surprising is that when you go to a city like Seattle and you expect to find 100% indie rock everywhere, um, it's amazing how, how, how much variety there is. And so, you know, when you go to Seattle, I feel like it's almost like going to Nashville. I mean, you have every different kind of music you could imagine. And it's, 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 I think that way in Chicago um, and and Detroit as well, where you know the the presence of one very strong scene absolutely um, you know kind of uh, bumps up the entire equation across the board musically. Great. Well, um, finally, what's next for Mason Bates? What's what's on the horizon? <laughs> I didn't know there was any life after this premiere just because it's the only thing I'm thinking now, but, um, it's, it's hard to, it really is hard to imagine life after mass transmission because it's <laughs> being premiered in San Francisco and then taking on, on tour to, to various places. However, uh, I, I do, um, I do have a couple of things on the agenda. I mean, the, the biggest thing is probably a, a violin concerto for the Pittsburgh symphony. And I believe it also, We'll, we'll travel to Detroit and, and perhaps Nashville um, for conductor Leonard Slacken and, and, and this extraordinary violinist, Anna Kiko Myers. That's probably the biggest thing I'm, I'm looking at right now. Um, but I don't think I'm going to be thinking about it until, you know, March 30th. Right. right. That's, well, when, uh, that's when this will finally be in my rearview mirror. Gotcha. That'll be nice. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to the Pittsburgh Symphony piece. That's that's my hometown symphony. Oh, really? Yeah. It's a fantastic orchestra. I'm I'm going to be there quite a bit next year. So great, great. Well, thanks so much for your time. This has been hey. eye opening. Cool, man. Well, great, great to talk, and I look forward to staying in touch. And um, absolutely, I I, uh, I appreciate it. Great. Thanks so much for your time. Nice to meet you. All right. Adios. Okay.